you for tuning in and for taking the time to just learn, listen, and uh, make also some contributions to this hour of empowerment. Now, before we go to today's topic and to my special guest, I want to just vent for a second about this fifth episode of Games of Throne, which was absolutely terrible and a heartbreaker, and I can't believe what happened. And I think a lot of you feel the same way. Now, today I read an article about uh, a woman who wrote that this was typical that uh, men were once again depicting the woman, the, the main heroine, as someone who is mentally unstable, incapable of uh, being the queen that she was uh, actually by everyone believed to be, and basically dismantled her entire uh, identity and everything that we all have rooted for and hoped for. And I have to agree. I think it was a huge mistake. And uh, I don't know how the last episode can fix it. So personally, I'm heartbroken, but it fits perfectly also into today's topic, which is about the divine feminine power and how it is completely different to what the masculine power is. And it's also something that's really needed in this world. Now, I guess I was lucky or can call it this way because I'm white, I'm a man, I was born in the West, and so I should not really complain, and I don't. But as sad as it is, when you really look at the state of the world, we are pretty much one minute before midnight, and this has a lot to do with what white male in the world, the patriarch, have done to the earth, have done to human mankind. So, it's not overly harsh to say that the biggest problems in the world, whether it's climate issues, whether it's about the, the uh, complete um, inequality of wealth, whether it's about the shortage of water, all those things that we are dealing with are basically created by the drive, the greed, that desire to compete and succeed that men, ha men have been um, you know, entertaining themselves with for many, many years. And in many ways, you know, there is now the time that, well, maybe women should be asked about how can we get out of this mess? What can we do to fix it? Is there a way to fix it? Because women certainly have a different opinion, a different approach, a different way of, uh, of engaging with life. But rather than asking women, well, right now what's happening, there is a war on women. Women get more and more suppressed. Women get more and more taken advantage of. The latest uh, anti-abortion uh, law in Alabama just shows basically women get pushed to the sideline. But they are no longer willing to be pushed to the sideline. I think the election showed it, the 2016 election showed it. I think, I mean, sorry, the 2018 election showed it. I think it showed also that, uh, you know, now there is just a greater movement of empowerment, like the Me Too movement, and uh, more voices are coming out that women are no longer being uh, ignored. They can no longer be pushed to the sidelines. And so that's why today's show is so important. And for me also, uh, really, heartfelt to have someone who is an expert in the divine feminine power on the show. And I'm talking about Dr. Ein Kate Sullivan, who is the author of several books, but two of them that we want to talk about are The Legends of the Grail and The Heroines of Avalon. Now, what's so interesting about her work is is that she is really going back to the mythologies of the Celts and the Irish and, and looks for the teachings of those goddesses and heroines that were revered at that time and what they can now help us with in this time to resurrect the divine feminine. So without further ado, I want to welcome 
And thank you so much for being on the show and taking your time to talking with us. Thank you for having me. It's a great topic. Well, yes. And it's a very, I think, important topic, especially right now that we are in this kind of, you know, choice point in our life and especially also with the 2020 election. But I wonder if you can tell us, do you feel that there is a war on women going on? It's a good, it's a good question. I, you know, 35 years ago when I started my, my quest to find the face of the divine feminine, um, I didn't feel there was a war so much. I felt that we'd just been completely ignored. And mm. I was thrilled to find these stories. And uh, at the time, I was, I was at King's College London, and my, my mentor, I wanted to write th these stories then. And this was in the late 80s. And she said, oh, you'll ruin your reputation. You can't do this. And so uh, over a period of time, my, my children said, mom, you really, really have to publish these stories because my, my generation needs them. So I, maybe I just had to wait until, <laughs> until now to bring them out. Um, and, you know, things have changed. You know, when, when I was studying it, I did a lot of research. Back then you had to go to libraries to do research, right? Mm -hmm. um, back, you know, and I would go to Trinity College and there were lots of busts of white men and I did wonder what I was doing there. Um, but I also felt that it was really important to follow in the footsteps of Lady Gregory and some of the great the great women and and remember something of the past so so really the most empowering stories about the feminine are, are pre-celtic back to the times of the tuatha de dunan um so uh is there war against women there's i think what's happening i have a slightly different take on it um you know i think there probably was a matriarchal age um and i do have a timeline a her story at, at the back of heroines of avalon um, so we're currently in what people call the culture of death and what the goddess represents is life. And so I feel that what we're actually at is a tipping point where we, we see if we're in a culture of death, if we keep harming each other, if we don't support each other, if we don't support the earth, if we don't think our bodies are important, we don't think, um, the elements are important, then we can the planet, we can do that. So we found that the experiment has failed. And so that's why, in a way, it's wonderful to reach back in time and say you know, there were these people, and, and we see it in indigenous cultures everywhere. There were people that knew how to live in alignment with the earth. They knew how to walk lightly here. They knew how to support each other. The men and women knew how to dance together. That's a culture of life. And that's, that's really what I've been interested in. And, and um, so if you're really doing culture of life, if you're really working with the goddess, what I love about her is she has a huge pot. And she stirs her pot, her grail, her cauldron, her, and everything's in there. So she's all accepting. So it's hard to have a war against somebody who accepts it all. Hmm. Well, that's a beautiful perspective. And, uh, you know, it's a very hopeful perspective. So obviously, you know, from your perspective, you do believe there is hope for us to actually listen again to that what is the divine feminine or what is you know the the teachings of the past that can help us to maybe change our relationship to our bodies to nature to the earth in general so you you have a rather hopeful view still i do it doesn't it doesn't go along with what's in the newspapers but but i believe we have the possibility we have the chance to step into a golden age if we if we do if we can, if but it requires a shift of mindset, a, a, a belief system so it actually does require that we hold hands and that we work together. And if we can make that shift, we could do something beautiful here on this planet. Now, what do you? I mean, you you mentioned that you know the, the many of the answers that you find are in the past. Now, just to to get uh, an idea of that past. So how came uh, the women at that past into the position of being revered and listened to and being the leaders? And what did the, the men at that time do differently than the men now? 
Well, if you look a little bit like Merlin, I would say you might carry a Merlin archetype. <laughs> and and you're in France, understand? And I think Merlin really liked France. <laughs> I know, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if we if we follow the people of the Merlin, the the Merlin, the Merlin people, the Merlin uh -huh. people, they go back to to the Tuatha de Dunan um, in Ireland and um, the the children of Danu, and so we're we're way we're way pre Christian at this point. Mm -hmm. Now okay. we're going into mythology here, yes. so so people say, Diving. "Is this true?" You know, who, who know who knows what the facts are exactly? But mm -hmm. um, there's something because what we start to work with are major archetypes. So you so let's say you're working with Merlin archetype, and let's say the Danny archetype we might know also is Demeter. So mother archetype. Now she's mm -hmm. ancient, obviously an ancient archetype. So are they real? Of course, of course. I mean, Merlin's been around for what ten thousand years or so. <laughs> so yeah. they're they're more ancient than we are. So when when we start to, what I like to do is I like to go to the places where these um, where these beings are known, these deities, different deities, and stand on the earth. So I started doing it. Oh my gosh, I think it was thirty five years ago when when I was given the overseas research award. And at that point, I, I had no idea. I, I knew I had heard of W.B. Yeats and I'd heard of Lady Gregory. And that was about it. And I thought I would go and there'd be this huge museum. And instead, I, I, I went and there were a lot of sheep that were blocking the road and <laughs> some people on tractors that had to wave down. And, and I found these, they're called the thin places. They're the, they're the ancient places. And, you know, when we, when we start to work with a... Um, a bardic sensibility or a mythic sensibility. You can you can have something. It's termed ontological shock. You might have heard that expression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, we might be faced with things we we don't think real or we don't think um, could possibly be true. And what happens when you go to old cairns? I don't know if you've had these experiences, but you go to old cairns and you know Stonehenge or Newgrange. Or, there's one in the north of France too, a wonderful stone circle in, in, in yeah. Brittany, I believe. Um, yes. So you go to these places, right? And um, all of a sudden, you're aware that there are other there are other presences. There's something that's happening, and that the world is very animated. So if you keep visiting. You have to, at some point, I had to give up my materialistic worldview <laughs> and start to realize that you know, the and some of these ancient beings, um, the Tuatha, actually actually really understood some truths that we lost. And, you know, they, they were really lost, I think, during the Roman invasion. And, well, and, and, the, and the chaos that reigned, at, it reigned right. afterward, too, you know. Um, but when you go back to the places, it's still there. We might be here now in, in 2019, but you can walk to that place and suddenly you can shift through time layers. And when you sh shift through those layers, you can go into the future too. But, you, you know, and obviously we're, we're in a poetic mythic mindset. We're not working with the 3D here. We start opening to other realms, opening. Some people call it the imagination, but... But as you really work with it, realize, ah, actually what we're doing, is, yes, we're using the imagination, but we're consciously dreaming. And as we do that, sometimes the other worlds will open to us. And what I've been noticing, and going back to these sites most recently, is that these sites are becoming really activated in a way I've never seen before. And um, a lot of dowsers and a lot of people who were sensitive are also talking about this. So. Whatever's happening on the planet, there's a shaking, there's an awakening, there's something going on. And I think if we can listen to it, it serves us. And um, so, can right. the, so the feminine, go ahead and say. <laughs> no, I mean, I, the I, feminine, just, I wanted to just mention that, you know, obviously this is something that when you are at these sites and uh, you know, also when you go to the sites in Egypt or, you know, sites that are just really sacred, uh, yes, there is an energy, a presence. There is a reason why these sites were built there, but uh, not everyone has the ability to go there. Now, 
be, after the break, I want to talk about how can we tune into what you experienced at these sites and what you learned at these sites uh, through your books and what can they teach us about that topic, that resurrection of the divine feminine. We will be right back after the break. I'm here with my guest, Dr. Ayn Kate Sullivan, who is the author of several books about the goddesses and heroines of the Celtic and Irish and the Isle uh, culture. And uh, But what we really wanna talk about is that they are deeper learnings and lessons and teachings from those stories and from those uh, uh, heroines and goddesses and, and that they can help us now during a time where we are at a tipping point, as we all know, on whether we gonna, as maybe a species, get erased or whether we just gonna turn it all around and create more harmony with each other with nature, with the earth. And, and so I want to ask you, and is there a specific goddess or heroine that for you stands out that you feel like, well, her qualities are especially right now pertinent during this time? What would you say? Well, we've been speaking about Danu. She's one of the most ancient mother goddesses. Um, she's, she's a very important one, but I want to bring another one in too. And she, she She's rather spicy. Her name is the Kaliach, and um, sometimes called Koilak, but Kaliach. And um, she's the old woman of the world. And sometimes, if you're on a heroine's quest, you go looking for her. And so she's quite famous in Scotland and Ireland and, and Wales. And, and you usually go looking for her when, when something isn't right. And because she's frightening, she's the ugly old hag. She's the witch. She's the she's the goddess of sovereignty, really. And when you when you go looking for her, she, she only reveals herself if it's time. And a lot of times, you might meet her when you're really when you really have some reverence. And what we're talking about is meeting Gaia, the archetype of Gaia, the Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, and there are places where you can crawl on your belly into these ancient cairns and you can put your back up against the stones and you can say, Mother, I want to dream with you. Show me how to dream with you. Let me hear you. Let me feel you. Let me smell you, taste you. Let me be, let me be in alignment with you so I can walk with you. It's a very beautiful thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that she's teaching, or you could say her teachings are that, that dreaming, that listening, that, that going inside, because all these archetypes are basically aspects of ourselves as well, male and female. So what would you yeah. say is the aspect inside that gets, you know, activated through that archetype? Her her story is the, the last one in Legends of the Grail. And if, if you when you read the story, it's the it's the young maiden who goes looking for her. And and in the story, she actually keeps meeting these men and she's making love with these men, but she doesn't realize that the Kaliach is also these men. <laughs> she's making love with all these different forms of the old woman of the world who finally reveals herself as the totality of the human experience. But um yes, yeah, she's um She's wonderful to go to um, in, in the Celtic tradition. Quite often people will go during Samhain or during Halloween, uh, the 31st of October to the 2nd of November, and they would crawl into these, these um, cairns or long barrows to, um, to actually speak to the dead. And that was part of the dreaming with the earth. It's like, how are we going to dream through the winter months? How are we going to dream in through the crisis, through despair, through, um, you know, the fact that we're all mortal, at, at least physically? And how do we dream through that? And what happens? What happens when we die? What happens if we do destroy this planet and we all, you know, have to walk elsewhere? And that's where maybe Danu comes in handy, but the, the uh, Legends of the Grail begins with Danu understanding that a time is coming where the, actually the patriarchy is coming and um, the miles, she's going to have to go underground and she's going to have to take her daughters with her. And so the, the book actually begins that way of the sorrow of, of 
of the you know the necessity of leaving Middle Earth and going into this she realm, the middle realm, the lower worlds, where they can continue to live, but and they can continue with their values of life and supporting the planet. Now, the she are she real? I think archetypally they're definitely real. And if you go to this, some of these places, you'll feel this the uh, you'll feel the presence of the the of the she or the fairy folk. So I would say they are real, and um, and that there are a lot of these places. If, if you do the practices in the book, I have a lot of uh, practices with trees, and one way to really begin to tap into the earth and how to live into alignment with, like, let's say we want right now. Let's just we're just going to decide we want it. We want life, not death. What if we just decide we're not going to destroy the planet? We're not going to destroy right. each other. We're actually going to live. Let's have a golden age instead. And so one way to do that is to go to a tree that you really love and to, and to know, you, you know, you can look at it and it's dark and solid and it's over, but you can enter your mythic imagination and you go to the tree and there's a doorway, maybe, if you're lucky, there's a doorway and it might, it might have stairs that lead down to this other realm and there might be some animals waiting there for you or a, a guide that will take you on an adventure and show you about your life and what is important for you what's next so you know the, these sorts of mythic journeys open mm. the world the world of the, the imaginal the world of the animated world but it's also called life yeah yeah, sorry, you just got, uh, I just lost you for a second. These sort of oh. mythic journeys, you said? Yes. So the mythic journeys lead us to life, to the mm -hmm. culture of life. And that's what's so beautiful. Now, let's say, for example, a man or a woman, they want to find more of the that kernel of maybe dormant divine feminine power, sacred feminine, whatever you want to call it. How would they even look for it? What would you say are things that you identify as this is what this uh, sacred feminine is all about? What are those qualities? So I'm going to answer it indirectly, but I used to take women to the Chalice Well in Glastonbury. Mm -hmm. I, I tried to take women. What I discovered very quickly is it never works only to take women because the men are just as interested as the women. So when we're when we're working with, you know, women want to develop their inner Merlin and men want to develop their inner Danu. So um, my son was one of the first ones that was like, mother, I am coming on these adventures. I don't really care what you say. I am with you. And so, um, so, so we've always, I had a, I've had a large basketball players and football players and all kinds of men coming and and yes they do i i think for men i'm actually working on kings and heroes right now because i think they're it's just as, as important now for men to understand what a leader is and there's something lovely in the celtic tradition there um so we're talking about the kalia and, and the goddess of sovereignty now in the celtic tradition if a man wanted to rule, but kings were, if a man wanted to rule as a king or a leader, he could only do so if his woman deemed it so. So we have the story in the book of the Cuhulan of Havna, and he wants to marry Emer, but he can't do that until he goes to Skyach and he and he finds his magic. So for men, the feminine, the 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 quest is really about finding your magic. Mm. And it comes from it comes. The magic does come from the feminine. And by magic, I mean how to cast a glamour, how to listen to the wind, how to, how to develop the clairvoyance, the clairsentience, the clairaudience. And, and I love coming out and I see some man who's just been completely in rejection of this whole thing. You know, this is, this is ridiculous. This is make-believe. You know, with his arms wrapped around a tree crying, saying, the tree is real. I know the tree is real. <laughs> you know, so you see the transformation. And it's so lovely because, like, my husband's a ex-middle linebacker. He played with the Jets, and <laughs> we go on quests together. And it's it's so lovely when I see him open, like he calls it his, um, you know, when he finds her goddess. Because all of a sudden, we can dance together. We can really have a deep, uh, mutually loving relationship. Mm. And um, so the 
So the queen deems it so. The queen says, now, and the reason that's important is because the, the woman, has hopefully some deep feeling, would understand how someone would lead. Now, of course, you, it doesn't have to be male, female. You can swap that too. But the point is, is that, that when you're divine feminine, you can really empower the masculine and the masculine and together you don't create a wasteland when the man tries to rule by himself you, in all throughout all celtic mythology you create a wasteland you create despair when they rule together when the king and queen rule together you create camelot you create you create the other a wonderful heaven on earth basically or seros here and um what so so rules by herself well, uh, Danu, when Danu comes in, she's in the Celtic tradition. the The first being that appears is almost always female. So, and then she creates the world. Um, but in speaking, um, like we have Queen Maeve, but they all, you know, the, the Celts weren't. They liked sex. You know, they weren't. <laughs> they weren't prudish. So they always wanted a lover. And, um, but when the queen ruled, if the true queen, like Maeve, if the queen Maeve um, was, was the, for a long time, if you wanted to be king, you had to find Queen Maeve and you had to make love with her. And if she wouldn't make love with you, you were toast, you know, you weren't, you weren't getting anywhere. So um, how do we pull that into this, this day and age? This day and age is, He's just, you know, I, I see you, I see your beautiful qualities, I see your, your Merlin archetype, and then you, maybe you see me. So it's, so we're seeing each other with mutual respect and understanding. Yeah. We come right back after a break. There is so much more to talk about. And so please stay tuned. Mm -hmm. 